What was the question again? You wanted to know just how I got into startups? <laughs> So someone pointed out something a little interesting in our Discord that both me and you have a good amount of experience going down the startup path. And I think both of us kind of take it for granted because we've just been in that world for so long. Uh, and they asked, can we do an episode on what it's like and why we did it and our experiences with it? So yeah, I think we can start with you uh, sharing a little bit about what your experience was like. Yeah, sure. No, I was just going to say, I can't believe we never thought to do this episode. Like it never was on my radar yeah. at all. <laughs> yeah, so obvious. Yeah. So I guess I started uh, StatMuse with a longtime friend back in 2014. Uh, I had kind of like first five, six years of my career done freelance stuff, had a little like software agency and saved up some money and then kind of quit my job with my co-founder and started StatMuse. I had always wanted to to do something higher risk. Like I knew I had a really good job, paid really well, but it was still like just a high paying job. And the, ultimately, like a lot of it was my friendship with my co-founder, Eli. Uh, we'd grown up together and we always kind of had said like, eventually we're going to do something together. Uh, we both were at a point in our career where we could kind of take a break and just quit our jobs and try it. That was a lot of it for me. It was just like, want to do something with this person and want to do something higher risk, higher leverage, not just kind of hours in, hours out, which is what my career had been to that point. That was the main reason. Yeah. Getting into it. Did anyone tell you it was a bad idea or did you think it was a bad idea? Uh, it's so hard to remember now. Uh, I mean, it's been eight, eight years, nine years ago. I, I don't remember. I know my wife was really supportive. Like we had saved quite a bit. Uh, so we were in a pretty good position. We had just built a house and just had a baby. So in that sense, it was kind of like awful timing, but it all worked out in the end. I guess it could have gone really badly. We did go a really long time. So I'd say six months in, uh, my wife was like, was this a good idea? Are we sure? Because we like we thought we'd raise pretty quick. Mm -hmm. And I think it was a year before we actually raised, which we don't even know. I don't even know, honestly, how we sort of like weathered that storm. We didn't think we had that much saved. <laughs> like we didn't have a whole year runway, but somehow uh, we kept the lights on, I guess. I mean, I know how I liquidated all my retirement accounts. That's what it was. I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. Hey, what about you? Yeah, I think for me, um, I think similarly, I always knew I wanted to do that. It was, it was very clear. Uh, I mentioned this before, my dad is also a software engineer, uh, which I think I take for granted a lot, but it gave me a lot of perspective. He pretty much spent his whole career, again, very successful career, worked his way pretty high up, had an ex extremely high paying job. Um, but like you said, at the end of the day, it's just a high paying job. And I kind of witnessed how he hit a ceiling where he just couldn't break through both on this, just both on the compensation side, like, you know, there's a ceiling on how much money you can make, but also on like the freedom side, you know, at the end of the day, he still had to make sure some other person was happy so he can get his high paying salary. Uh, and he was, you know, his day to day, he liked his job, but there were a lot of parts of it that he didn't like and like just dealt with, uh, and didn't really have any power really to make that any different. Yeah. So similarly, I started out as a consultant, like, like you, I like worked freelance, uh, independent, uh, and it was very clear that, okay, if I'm going to work 60 hours a week, I'm just going to get 60 hours of pay. And of course that rate went up over time, but it's a, it's pretty like linear. Like it just goes up in a linear amount. And at some point you kind of cap out. I wasn't building anything that compounded over time. I wasn't really able to take advantage of my skill set. And the other thing with a high paying job is if you are very, very, very good at what you do at a company, you probably might make like 20 or 30% more than someone who is not very good at what they do at the company. A company is never going to pay you like five times more than they pay someone else. Uh, so at a certain point, you just have to go down your own route, I think, if you really want to capitalize on that. Uh, no company is going to really meet your value if you think you, you have you know really high value. The only, re only real way to capture that is by building something you own. Um, so I think, yeah, it was clear for me. And I think at a young age, I did start a company with a friend similar to you, like a childhood friend that I knew really well. I think that's really key. If you start a company, 
Uh, I know it's worked out with people where they've like met random co-founders, but in general, it is one of the most intimate relationships you're ever going to have in your life. And uh, yeah, you need to do it with someone that you have some background with. So you're not going into it, like learning all this stuff about this person. Like you already know their quirks and you already know how your relationship with each other is going to work out. That company got acqui hired. Uh, and then pretty much my whole career since then, I've been either very early stage employee, like either the first real employee uh, or, you know, in a founder role. And yeah, I've, I've loved every second of it. It's something that is extremely hard. But like I said, my primary goal is to have freedom with my life and making it exactly how I want it to be. Uh, and you can't really do that when someone else is telling you, okay, you have to be here at this time to make this money. Um, yeah. So that, that like underlying motivation, like no matter whether it's going good or bad, I know that I, I just like knew I couldn't give up on, on any of it. Cause that was the most important thing. Yeah. So that I would say like going from consulting or freelance to startup life, it was like on the one hand doing it for kind of financial reasons, like hoping to like have a bigger outcome in the long run. It was a near term shock though. I mean like a lot of changes of lifestyle immediately. So just like making a lot less as an entrepreneur, I guess. But that freedom that you said, like that was the the noticeable thing is like you thought you're free when you're freelance before that. Like you're kind of like you're you're dating all of your clients. You're not really like married to anybody. Mm -hmm. So you feel like you're kind of roaming around. But at the end of the day, like people are expecting things of you every single day. And once you start a startup, you realize like it's a blessing and a curse, but like Nobody's expecting anything of you. Like I was pretty well shielded from our investors, uh, my co-founder kind of managing those relationships. And it's really like I had five years there where you kind of have to decide what's worth doing every day, which is mm -hmm. super fun and liberating. But also that, that part can be stressful because you kind of doubt like, am I doing the right thing? Are we going the right way? Mm -hmm. Like all that stuff. I mean, the classic thing is I think every founder resonates with this. There's days where you wake up and you're like, wow, we are amazing. We are doing every single thing right. And literally the week after that, you'll wake <laughs> up and you'll feel like this is a huge mistake. We're doing every single thing wrong. Yeah. So it's a crazy roller coaster. And I heard I heard you say this the other day, which me and, me and Liz have talked a lot about where you said your co-founder, Eli, his like skill is that he just refuses to let StatMuse die. Yeah. And that at the end of the day is the only thing that it matters. Really is. Like just not, not giving up for enough time you're going to have something that works out. I think Paul Graham has a whole essay about this where he's just like, if you refuse to die, you'll get rich. That's like startups are very complicated. Lots of things you have to figure out. But at the end of the day, uh, if you stick with it long enough, there's just so many moments where you can give up and quit. If you just refuse to do that for long enough, that's, it's just going to work out. And it, like, it just, it just can't. Uh, so if you optimize for your motivation, um, that's kind of the thing that matters at the end yeah. of the day. Yeah. Okay. I've got a quick anecdote. Uh, about my co-founder. So Ooh, yes. uh, we started StatMuse, which is like a sports statistics site. Uh, and we started with the NBA. We were both big basketball fans. We were actually both co-captains of our high school basketball team. So I, I have, I'm really tall. I mean, I'm not really tall. I'm like 6'3", six, 6'4". Six, uh, but I have like long legs. I, I'm a pretty good runner, but I'm like a short distance runner. Like I'm such a sprinter, which so maps to my like work style. Uh, I could run really like when we did our conditioning drills in basketball, I could run what they like a set of 10, like we run the court 10 times. I could run them like in 49 seconds, which is really fast. But he, we had this thing every year our coach did that was like this thing we dreaded all year that was called 10 set day, where we had to do 10 sets of 10. So it's this like long endurance thing. And I could not make it through 10 set day. I never did my whole four years of high school. Like I just gave up halfway through or whatever. And Eli <laughs> was like dragging freshmen to the, like, he's just like, that is his thing. It's like, he will not quit <laughs> anything. Uh, so it's so mapped to stat news. Like uh, five years in, uh, we sort of like hit a point where our relationship and to your point, like you got to really know the person. There's just so many hard things when it comes to startup stuff. I can't imagine doing it with somebody that I didn't really know or that I had, like, if you have reasons to bail because you don't really have a good relationship, you're going to bail, I would think. Uh, and Eli being kind of this longtime friendship of mine and just his personality really made it possible to be there five years. But ultimately, like, I haven't been there for the last three years and Eli has still been going. I, I think that is such a huge, huge part of it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it, it, it just does boil down to that, um, the endurance thing. And, you know, I've been doing this for a very long time. Like probably my whole career pretty much have been around this world and that this concept didn't really click for me until I would say this year, um, where 
now that me and Liz are working on something together, it's, it's just so clear that that's the challenge that's just constantly in the back of your head. Yep. Um, but yeah, if you can, if you can conquer that, it is, that's really all you need to do. You will have some form of success eventually. Uh, I think people say this all the time. They're like, companies don't run out of money. It's that the founders run out of energy. Um, there's, there's like always a way to keep going if, if you can do it. Can we talk about how we have these like freaky, similar stories at our startups? Yeah. Well, yeah, I guess like I just said, I haven't been at Sammy's for three years. So like five years in, Eli fired me, which was like a whole shock. I was depressed for months. I mean, I knew like we couldn't keep going the way that we were going. We both were just at each other so bad after five years. And like, there was just a lot of personal, each of us kind of resented each other and lost a lot of respect for each other over various things. Uh, We were just pretty like toxic and we had to have like somebody on a call with us. We just couldn't get anything done. Uh, So it needed to happen, but it was still a shock. And then ultimately like gone for three years during that period, had new investors come in and buy a lot of my stake in the company. So then I don't know how we discovered we have like this exact same story, but we were talking at reInvent and the same thing basically happened to you, right? Timing and everything. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Probably the exact same time. I think I was like maybe like six months uh, after all this happened to you. Like I was like six, like a six month offset. Uh, so a similar story. I uh, early stage company was going incredibly well. And then at some point me and the founder just started to run into a whole, whole bunch of issues. And in my case, it was, uh, the founder was pretty inexperienced and he was just hiring a bunch of people that had no business to be at a startup. And just kind of, we went from being like the best company I ever worked at to like the worst company I ever worked at in a span of, of six months or so. And then like a whole bunch of stuff, like he like wasn't transparent about all these deals he did with the investors. Like, and I ended up diluting everyone in mm. ways that did not make any sense. Uh, so it just got to a point where we were just like, it was really bad. Like, I, it's, I think I was like basically refusing to work at some point. Uh, Cause they like completely messed up all my compensation stuff. Uh, and eventually he fired me, which again, similar situation. Like I should have been fired and I was just kind of waiting for it to happen. And it happened and like, it was actually crazy. I then went back to consulting and I was like, why am I getting so much work done? Like I'm spending like two hours a day and I'm getting like way more work done. It turned out just the energy toll of being in a place that was just constant agitation and constant fighting that just takes up your entire day. Like you're probably just sitting there thinking about these, ar- you're having these arguments in your head like yeah. every single day. Yeah. And that takes up a big amount of your time. But then similarly to you, somehow, and this company should be dead. And again, <laughs> going back to this, keeping stuff alive forever. This company 100% should be dead. It's still alive today. At some point, somehow new investors came <laughs> in to this disaster of a company. And I was like, hey, hey, buy my equity out. And they did. And I guarantee you to this day, I will be the only person that ever makes money off <laughs> of this startup. It's just, it's just been like investor after investor coming in and losing their money. So yeah, they bought us out and... And yeah, so fired by the CEO, both of us uh, at a company where we spent, you know, a lot of time putting in all of our effort. So Yeah, but then we got we got something out of it. I'm actually back at StatMuse now, and I don't think I'll be the only person to make money. I'm I'm back on StatMuse. I'm on the rocket ship. We're going to the moon. Uh, that's how you always feel when you're at a startup. <laughs> <laughs> except when you don't yeah. except like you said it's every other week it's such a roller coaster like it really <laughs> is there were so many times we were close to acquisition and you're just on this mountain and but the, it's those moments when you're close to acquisition for us we were there's a few times that things were going so well that's why we were close to acquisition that you're kind of almost too optimistic and like you get all like stingy like i don't want to take just any deal mm. and then it falls through and you go into like a trough of depression and you take whatever anybody would give you but nobody wants to because it's, it's just how it works. Yeah. It's kind of exactly what happened to us too, was we were doing really well. And then I just kind of took my hands off of, okay, I'm just going to focus on the engineering stuff. And I mistakenly like let some parts of the company go. And that's when like, you know, all like the terrible deals with the investors happened. Uh, just again, because of inexperience from the CEO. Yeah. Um, I think at this point he owns must, he must own like 3% of the company <sighs> and I, he's not even CEO anymore. So I'm like, it's just not worth your time anymore. You know, it's like, yeah, it's a bad situation. Um, I mean, I also did get something out of it. I, I met Liz, my wife at the company. So in a way, best possible exit yeah. that you can have. Yes. <laughs> Sold your stake, found a wife. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it worked out pretty well. Uh, so we had a bunch of questions, didn't we? I think we kind of posed this, that we were doing this episode. This is unique for us. 
Yeah, yeah. So I, we had we had a few ep- questions that people in Twitch chat asked, so we can we can go over them. Um, so I'm gonna try to do this in an order that is somewhat cohesive. So people ask, at what stage in your career does a start- startup become logical to pursue? Any thoughts on that? I mean, for me, it was after we had some money saved. I mean, maybe you do it right out of college. I don't know. Are there pros and cons? I could have missed something. I don't know how I would have done it though. When I was, we were newly wed. Had I not been married yet, maybe right out of school, I could have done something like this. But I think with any one person kind of like depending on you in any way, it may, it would make it really hard, I think. So I was all about making money right after school. Here's the thing I, you definitely should not do. And I think a lot of people think about it this way. They're like, I need to have X, Y, Z experience before I go do this. Like you're like preparing for the thing. But the best way to prepare is to just actually do the thing. Like there's no... Like, of course, you're going to learn skills in, in any place you work. But I think people have this like life plan where they're like, I'm going to go work at a big company. Then I'm going to work at a small company. Then I'm going to go. So it's just like life doesn't work that way. Just if you want to do the thing, just go do it. Yeah. Uh, I think the major constraint, I think what you just said speaks to this is uh, it does take a lot of focus and effort. So you have to figure out what is like the baseline of your life that you can support while you're entirely focused on this thing. So if you have a bunch of savings, I like guarantees you can sustain probably a pretty high level of quality of life while you're focused on this thing. If you are someone super young that has no responsibilities and can live with their parents, like that's another way to do this, right? Like you have your baseline of life is like, you know, is, is covered and you can just kind of focus on this thing. So yeah, for me, it's less of an experience thing and more of a, can you actually focus on this thing in your life right now? And there's different ways to, to achieve that. Yeah. You don't want to be stressed about just basic needs and stuff like that. Uh, trying to get something off the ground. It's too much to think about. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think things have changed a lot when I was first starting. When I was first starting, I think it was pretty uh, not normal for uh, founders to take any kind of significant salary. It was like kind of seen as like a red flag. Yeah. I think it's changed a lot now because investors realize like that's just kind of productive. Like at the end of the day, like they're going to take a salary that accounts for like 5% of the runway or 10% of the runway. It's like really nothing just to yep. give them the ability to fully focus on it. I've even seen certain investors be like, uh, send me a list of every single thing that you need to do. That's not related to your company. Uh, we'll make sure that it's taken care of by someone else. So everything from like your personal taxes to cleaning your house to like whatever, like they, they understand there's like a value in letting, letting people really focus. I think we were kind of in that early, that stage you're talking about where it was like, mm-hmm. don't take a big salary culture. Uh, but we had really good investors. Once we actually did raise our A, it was a bunch of strategics and stuff. And then the VCs were mm-hmm. really kind. Uh, so they were all about like making sure we weren't distracted with personal stuff. We, I felt like we got paid pretty well the whole time at Stamuse. But I didn't think that was typical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it makes all this a little bit more more viable. I think before it was like bleed for five years and then uh, yeah, and then maybe you'll have some kind of exit. What was the next question? Is location important for the success of your startup? I mean, that's, I think you have a really good perspective on this. Yeah. I mean, I have always lived in the Ozarks, which is not a tech hub, it turns out. Contrary to popular belief, (laughs) actually. (laughs) Uh, There's not really a tech scene here, but my co-founder lives in San Francisco. So I feel like StatMuse doesn't have its story if Eli's not out in San Francisco, because he did do a ton of fundraising out there, like met personally with a lot of the people that became close allies of the company. Uh, I do think there's something to that, that sort of startup uh, ecosystem in cities where they have such a thing. Just like the logistics of tr- the travel, like uh, th- there is just a, a huge contingent of people who still want to meet you in person and especially the older people that have all the money. Uh, I don't know, maybe that's changed since the pandemic and I, I hope so for people that want to start a company from wherever they're at. Uh, I was able to live in the Ozarks and co-found it remotely with my my co-founder, but we had a pretty good relationship. Yeah, I don't know. Is that what you were thinking I was going to say? Yeah, yeah. I think similar. I think my perspective is similar. It's definitely possible. So you shouldn't let your location stop you. Um, literally, there's examples of people starting companies in every situation. So at this point, we know it's all possible. Uh, but yeah, like like Adam said, there are just like tailwinds that you have when you are in a certain location. Um, you can kind of like get embedded a little bit more in in the network, things like that. Again, all possible to do remotely plus traveling when you need to. Yeah, I mean, like when we were in New York, it was nice to just be able to go meet investors for coffee, whatever, whoever it was, our customers. Now we're in Miami, like we have customers in New York and Liz has to fly there to like, you know, do launches and stuff, Yep. Uh, which you know, is a little bit more overhead, but again, still possible. And it's not like Miami's 
you know, Miami has its own own scene here, as I was talking about earlier. Yeah, it, it, it does help, but you don't need it. Yeah, and I'm sure it's even more possible now in the last few years with, I'm, I'm sure there's a lot more venture capitalists that are willing to not shake your hand and give you checks <laughs> <laughs> since they've had to start doing the Zoom stuff. Yeah, yeah, exactly. There's another question. Uh, I think I have a lot of thoughts on this one, but uh, for engineers considering a startup which comes with a significant amount of equity, can you explain equity dilution and how it impacts engineers? So you're talking about like as an employee or as a founder coming in as a founding engineer? Do you think the question? I think the dilution applies to everyone. Yeah, no, it does. I guess uh, my answer might have been different because I just don't think I, I just don't think it's a good idea to work for a startup. I think start a startup, mm. <laughs> but that's a whole other question. <laughs> I think, I guess as a founding engineer, how does dilution affect you? I mean, like you'll start out depending on how many co-founders with a big chunk. <laughs> In my case, you know, we each started with 50%. And then when I left five years ago, before I sold most of my stake, I think that was down to 20%. We had raised something like $20 million. It's just a, it's inevitable that your equity stake goes down as the company gets bigger but they always say, like, what do they say? It's better to have a little bit of a big thing. 1% of a billion, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, whatever. I think there's a few things here. Um, so, yeah, like Adam, I think a lot of people join, employees join startups and think their equity is going to be worth a bunch. It, like, almost never is a life-changing amount. And, like, by definition, it can't be. You have a shot if you can be literally the first hire, maybe. I think anything after that, like, if you're not literally the third person, there's two founders and maybe you're the third person. It's kind of like my situation at SST. Anything after that is not going to be life-changing. So you're doing this thing not for a life-changing outcome at that point. And I think people don't really understand that. Um, just with the, with the way the numbers work, you don't, you're, not going to ha- you're not going to start off with enough to like make an amount that's going to like do a... I'm sure you can make some money, but it's not going to yeah. like change your life for the most part. Yeah, and the dilution is like kind of crazy. So if things ever at all don't go well which is very likely <laughs> at a startup, uh, you probably are going to be wiped out to near zero. Um, like if, if the company has to take a down round, which a lot of companies are going through right now because they were over, overvalued during during the pandemic, a lot of them are taking down rounds. When you take a down round, what that means is your previous equity was worth too much, so we're going to correct that effectively. And the people they correct it from are the people with qu- like common stocks, so the people, the founders, employees, like the non-investors. Uh, when that happens, it basically goes to zero. So you need to start off with enough where even when those things happen, like you're still going to end up with enough. I just tell people not to consider equity at all when they're working in a startup. I still think working in a startup is a good idea, but mostly because uh, you are someone earlier on in your career and it's your only way to get a ridiculous amount of responsibility that you're going to be insulated from at a bigger company. So it's like, if you're going to work there, it's for personal growth. Yeah not for any like financial outcome. It can set you up incredibly well to do your next thing, but that little thing probably isn't going to, is not going to work out. Yeah. I think my perspective on it is so like, uh, is jaded the right word? It's so, uh, skewed because as a founder, I know we dangle the equity carrots to like employees to hopefully motivate them. Like we want them to be aligned. (laughs) That's founder speak for like, (laughs) we want you to work really, really hard, uh, because you want to see this potential outcome. But like, I know how rare that is. And even just like when employees leave or when bad things happen and you have to fire employees like or lay them off, uh, they have to buy those options. Like all those things, I know just like the chances of any employee you hire seeing a big payout from that equity, it, they're slim. Yeah, yeah. The, the buying the options thing is also another crazy thing because it's like you basically when you leave, you have to like make a decision like do i think this is going to be worth anything or should i just give up on it and that's like it's always super annoying it's tricky a a little hack to avoid dilution as much is start a company with your spouse because then Ah. on day one most founders start with 50 percent equity but on day one we started off with 100 percent of equity in our household interesting which means every every single point where we get diluted we get diluted like a lot less than than amazing actually most people hang on i gotta go talk to casey Uh, i gotta call her (laughs) <laughs> Got a new idea. <laughs> it it also lets you give way more equity to employees, so we can roughly give out double because we have a lot more that we're working yep. with. Um, so yeah, it's like a funny little thing we didn't realize till later. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> so for step one, fi- find a spouse. <laughs> step two, make sure you two work together and it won't ruin your relationship. <laughs> step three, then start a company. Yeah. Uh, easy hack. 
Okay. Uh, then some questions, I guess, on the product side, uh, or actually, no, let's stick, let's stick to more on the business side for now. Um, did you have to cold call in-person advertise to businesses or was your approach focused exclusively online? I don't think it applies to stat news. We're just, uh, like a website for consumers. We don't have like a sales arm. We don't make money basically. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I think more generally, though, when you do start a company, you are going to be doing some form of approaching random people, whether it's, uh, you know, maybe you're trying to raise money, maybe you are trying to do a partnership with some other company. Um, so there probably is there is a lot of that. If you haven't done that, if you're just an engineer, and you've never done that type of thing before. It is something you have to get comfortable doing. It is a huge asset when you build a network. I'm telling you, it is so much easier than you expect. The moment you like plant a flag and say, I'm going to build this thing, people show up in your life. People like show up in your emails. Like it definitely is possible. I know it feels impossible when you're starting off with nothing. Uh, but literally every single founder you see with a good network and investors, they start off with nothing and they weren't really like special or anything. Yep. Plus one. <laughs> this is a interesting how to cope with your startup money running out and employees not getting as much freebies. Wait, what? What does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> employees not getting as much freebies like your company's cutting back i mean this just goes back to where, why being an employee at a startup is, is tough like you don't you don't get that cushion that other companies have but you know big companies are doing layoffs now too um, yeah i think the trade-off is that at a small company if you are very good you have a chance to retain your job because you are good even during rough times at a big company it kind of doesn't matter if you're good <laughs> or not they just need to cut x number of people and you're just you're just you're just out yeah we did i mean at sammy's we never I guess we never changed our like new hire budget. So like Mm. we had like a $5,000 equipment slash whatever you need to be comfortable budget where you could buy a desk or a chair or whatever. Uh, And then generally like expenses were pretty loose and we trusted people, but I think you don't hire that many people. So you're not too worried about like in an early stage startup. We didn't, I mean, total Mm. ended up hiring 30 35 people, something like that. Yeah. I think, uh, I think a lot of companies, a lot of startups operate like big companies, even though they're not, and they'll hire a lot of people and they'll need to like cut back and rethink things. That's always painful because taking away stuff is hard. Uh, and the way we think about it at SST is, uh, for where we want to go, like our ambitious, most ambitious goals, we probably over the whole lifetime of our company to get there, we'll probably only need to hire 10 people total. So when you kind of think of it that way, like I only need to find 10, like really amazing people, uh, you kind of don't sweat like the little details around like how much exactly are they making or like, what are they getting? It's, we know if there's someone's good, like it's it's just going to be worth it because we only need to find 10 of them. How do you know your product is ready for development? Like from a technical level? I know like the indie hacker right answer. Like if you think it's ready, just it's not, or you're too late. No, say, no, say, say the real answer. Okay. Real answer. Uh, so what we did was we had a, a, di- a deadline tied to the real world. We were launching a product for NBA fans and we were starting in July and in October, the season starts and we really wanted to, uh, launch it with the peak excitement around the season starting. So that, that was like a three month or whatever forcing function where we're going to ship whatever we have in those three months. Our product is a little unique in the sense that, I mean, it's just an input. It's like Google. It's like a search box. And then it's just how good are the results. So it was was pretty easy for us to just say, like, it's good enough. Mm -hmm. I don't know with more complicated, maybe you want to speak with Boomi, like from like a customer-driven development standpoint or something. Yeah, I think what Adam was losing earlier with the whole indie hacker thing where it's like, just ship garbage. It's fine. (laughs) Um, So the mentality. (laughs) (laughs) Which, okay, I get. It just comes down to like, does that click with you, right? So for me, no, it doesn't because a big part of my advantage is that when people use my product, they're going to feel like, oh, this like feels like they're not going to be able to put their finger on. This feels better than most stuff that I use. And that's a big selling point for anything that I I try to build. And I mean, there's, there's a flip side, right? I can like spend way too much time getting there and building something that nobody actually wants. So the key is don't forget that your idea for your company is probably going to change a lot when you have people using it and they tell you about their problems and ideas. Like the feedback is insane. Like I'll go from not caring about a concept to like obsessing over solving it. Cause I just heard that somebody had like, I like witnessed someone with a specific problem. So it's good to have stuff out there because it makes everything a lot easier when you're working without having any users, you're just making up stuff and you're trying to have a vision. 
when you have users, they just tell you exactly what to do. So it is nice to have stuff out there. That said, like, I'm just, I think we've gone too far with that advice. And now people are just like showing off how shitty their yeah. stuff is when they launch. I'm like, that's, that's not the goal. That's, is that the world we want to live <laughs> right. in? Like, yeah. How do I convince my co-founder it's time to abandon? I did have you had conversations like that? Uh, yeah, actually before I was fired, I mean, I was, I don't know if I should say this. I don't know. Honestly, Ooh, this is our hundred listeners are going to get a little scoop here. Uh, like I don't, I just don't know if like investors could come after me or something like fiduciary duty or something. I don't know. Should I not say it, Dax, what I'm about to say? I don't know what you're going to say. So, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I was very on the record with Eli that we just gotta, we gotta get out. We gotta like not abandon it, but Every time we had an opportunity to sell, I was very hard on like, let's just sell this thing because we just didn't have like a plan to make money. Mm-hmm. And we didn't know exactly everyone, like our investors, Disney, Google, these people, like they're strategics. They don't, they're just like, grow it big, make it big. Don't worry about money. But like we had to eventually worry about money. And I just felt like our best path is to get acquired by one of these companies. So I was very like adamant. In fact, I sent an email or I sent a message to Eli one time in the last months before I left that was like, we just, we got to tell, I'm not going to say who, but we got to tell this person we're ready to do a deal. Like it was this acquisition talks that kind of gone on. And it was like me basically saying, let's just tell them we're in business, whatever. Uh, He got very upset that like, you don't do that. You don't. Uh, it's just fiduciary duty, something, something. I don't know. I probably broke some rules, some startup rules. Okay. I'm sorry. <laughs> I've repented from my startup <laughs> sins. I don't know. That was uh, that was me just like, it's 10 set day. I'm done. I can't do this anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, my wife was so done. Casey was just so tired of like waiting for it to get better because we had cut back salaries. We had like done a lot of things in the last year because fundraising was tough. So uh, we were just kind of personally pretty done with it. Yeah. I think it's, uh, it's hard. I mean, it's, we, we started by talking about like, you know, not giving up and that is a big part of it, but yeah, there are situations like that. I mean, I did similar situation where I try to convince uh, the founder to, again, similar. I wasn't saying like abandon it. I was saying just look for any kind of exit and we can start on, an, on our next thing. Yeah. Because in that situation, it was cause like he accepted this ridiculous deal that went, that left him with like no ownership. And I was like, it doesn't matter if this company like is incredible. You have no ownership or control. The whole point of doing all of this is now gone. Um, just it's okay. Like it's your first startup. It's pro- it was probably going to fail anyway. Like just write it off and let's move on. We can do something else. But I couldn't get through to him. He kind of saw it as like, no, this is like the vision. Like I need to stick with it. I need to uh, stay with it. And I he's still working on it. And I've lived like five different lives <laughs> since then. And it's like I can't believe he's still like doing the same thing. And also. It's a little bit of like, I mean, this, is like this is petty, but I'm going to say it. When I got fired, so pretty much the whole time I was there, it was uh, just me for a year. Then we hired like one, we hired Alan. Uh, we hired one person. Mm. Then we hired another person. Uh, basically three, effectively three engineers for, you know, three years or so. Um, and we built the product and then they fired me. And before they fired me, I, I like all, all engineers left as well. And like, I think Alan joined a company I advised and another one joined one of the companies I was consulting at. Uh, so all the whole engineering team was gone. They replaced us with a bunch of other engineers. And I believe at some point it was like eight or nine engineers. Right. Uh, and it's been three or four years since then. And they were going to like rewrite the whole thing. Uh, <laughs> I can still go to this site and I can see it is still running the same, co- <laughs> the exact same product, the exact same application that we left. Uh, like it now we've been gone for more time than we were there <laughs> and they have not, been able to rebuild this thing. And that, that like, brings me so much <laughs> happiness. Like you thought you could just, you thought I was like not important. You, just, you can just let me go and it was going to be uh, fine. Well, you're still running the same thing. You're still doing the same thing. All the same bugs are still there. Like I, I can see them. I love it. Um, and it's, it's been years and I don't, I have no, I, at this point I have no idea what, what they were doing. Like, I don't know how it's like not even a little replaced at this point. So that makes me feel great. It makes me feel great. I go check it out every story. once in a while and it feels good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right let me see there's uh i think we got through all the questions let me see oh did we really yeah i think that was it unless i missed something but i guess we've gone on a little longer than normal that's okay do you have any other thoughts i don't think so this was fun though yeah it was fun i think just to summarize um if you're interested in all doing it don't wait too long like you are ready today uh, as long as you can dedicate some time to it uh find someone you can really 
trust and can work with. I mean, like Adam said, it could potentially like torpedo your relationship, but it hasn't happened to me yet. <laughs> so it can also work yeah, out. Yeah, and we're and me and Eli are on good terms again. So like we're, our story is one of it torpedoed a lifelong friendship and then it's back. Like we're we're good now. Yeah. Uh what one thing I did think, Dax, just hearing you tell that last story is like on the one hand, in the same podcast you've said that like the key is to stick it out and to live long enough, like things will work out. But then on the other hand, this founder that you worked with, a CEO, Mm -hmm. stuck it out, but maybe just like needs to read the situation better. Like he is keeping it alive long enough. Yeah. But like, what are his incentives to do so? Like, what is the payoff if he only owns 3% of the company or whatever? So you got to live long enough that the company makes it. But if the company makes it and you don't really benefit that much, what was it all? Was it worth a decade of your life? Like, that's the question. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You got to keep that in mind that it still all has to make sense. It shouldn't have, the outcome shouldn't be like, oh, if I just worked at some boring company for 10 years, I would have been in a better place. As soon as that becomes true, like the whole thing doesn't make sense. Good stuff. This is like a double episode, I think. I can't really read the timer from here. Is it that long? I mean, has it been 39? Is that what that says? 39, yeah, I guess, I think it's close to double. Let's do the actual math. What the listeners need to, I'm just kidding. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right. Thanks, Dax. See ya. See ya.